My name is Jeffrey Cam, and I'm the host of Digital Oil and Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at JeffreyCan.com. Welcome back to Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey Can, and I'm the host of this podcast. I'm uh, here today with David Johnson, who is the chairman of the Petrolink Group of Companies, or as uh, David likes to say, just uh, simply Petrolink, make it keep life simple. David, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for letting me join you today. And where are you calling in from, uh, David? I know this sounds like we're in the same room, but the reality is uh, where the time and distance uh, makes this all a bit of a mystery. But so where are you based today? Uh, I'm based in Houston, live in Katy, just west of Houston, so I'm enjoying some uh, nice, mild winter weather. Uh, it's a beautiful, sunny day outside, and I wish I was golfing. <laughs> well, I like to remind people, though, that the cold weather <clears throat> is the smell of money uh, in the <laughs> gas industry. So, <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> don't, correct. Don't, be, don't begrudge cold weather. Uh, so uh, to, uh, what I'm really interested in is a, a kind of an uh, observation about the industry, the oil and gas industry, specifically the upstream industry, is that the advent of uh, digital innovation into the field uh, creates tremendous opportunity uh, for uh, both producers uh, in the field as well as the, uh, companies that involved in the supply chain uh, to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of, of operations. And this has a whole range of spin-off benefits. And I think this is a heart and soul to where Petrolink is, is uh, playing today. Um, so that's what we want to talk about. And, and uh, my, I hope my outcome out of this, my goal is, is that uh, at the conclusion of this podcast, uh, it, it, companies who may be listening who are curious about uh, how to leverage the and harness the data from their business operations in field, um, I might see some value in, in following up to, to learn more about the, this whole area. So that's, that's the goal, and that's where we're going to go today. Uh, but uh, to begin, David, why don't you just share a little bit about your background? Like, where, where, How did you get into, uh, into this particular field of, uh, of endeavor? Sure, you bet. Uh, my formal training is actually as a computer scientist and a data management specialist. Uh, about 25 years ago, I joined the oil and gas industry and left the uh, the, the university that I was employed at. Uh, joined them as a junior software developer uh, for a small engineering firm that was bought by uh, a major company. And then it was bought by a major company and ended up in the oil and gas industry. Um, during that journey, I moved from development into solution design, system design, and spent most of my technical career uh, leading or managing teams of developers and system architects, uh, database architects, uh, in making oil and gas-related software, sometimes for our parent company at the time, uh, but uh, often for, uh, for sale, for oil companies to actually use. And then a short time later, I actually joined um, Petrolink, uh, and uh, and you know took over their product management, and then later their their chairman role. And in, as the, as the chairman, what what what's your role? How is that uh, how's that different from roles you've had in the past? Sure. Well, I'm a hands-on uh, software engineer. I, I like to design things. I like to build things. And unfortunately, I've had to defer that to uh, to my lieutenants, to other people in the organization. The chairman role in, in a company like Petrolink is to help coordinate and work with the other uh, senior managers, <clears throat> excuse me, in the company as we, uh, you know, ensure the, the solutions that we're building will help address our clients' needs in the space of the real-time infrastructure, digital uh, platforms, uh, and analytical solutions and uh, edge-based uh, uh, solutions that they require for their daily operations. Well, those, uh, those of you who are listening, of course, can't see uh, the podcast, but I can see David through the uh, camera here. He's, he's wearing a nice teal t-shirt, uh, which tells you <laughs> which tells you that Petrolink is pretty cool. <laughs> now, let's, uh, let's turn to the business problem that, that uh, you're, you're seeing and that you're trying to solve. And uh, I wonder if you just could characterize that for me. I mean, I've, I've, I've laid it out, I, I believe, as, as this, uh, this wave of digital innovation hitting the field, but would be curious to hear your words as how you would describe it. You betcha. No problem. Yeah, Petrolink's prime purpose and the, the, the challenge that keeps us awake at night, or at least you know, has us excited about the future, is the ability to innovate around real-time data infrastructures. 
this means that every single day we worry about how we collect information, how it's processed, how it's standardized, how it's secured, and how that environment, that digital environment, in, excuse me, environment is secured, and how the management of, and flow of that data is um, allowed to occur so that it can uh, benefit those that are working in this industry, whether it be a service company that is working for an oil company or the oil company itself that is trying to understand how that lease or how that, uh, that play that they're working on is being exploited. Uh, so it's really about the data foundation for us from, from the moment a piece of information is collected at a sensor uh, right through its eventual reporting and and uh, and archiving and how that can bring value to the oil company, and to me it's just amazing because you know we think about the Internet of Things as being uh, kind of a wave of the future and and where we're going. Well, if we apply that to the oil and gas industry, in order to have an Internet of Things, you have to have a way of actually. Uh, collecting that information and taking advantage of it. And that's that's what Petrolink does. So the uh, the way the industry does that today or his, historically um, is through uh, the uh, – and this is after wells have been put into production – is through a SCADA system typically. Some, some many, many wells actually don't ha- uh, have uh, real-time connectivity to the well. Uh, so just help help characterize this where where you see the the uh, the the problem uh, space here is it in delivery of the well such as sensors behind the bit that give you directional guidance or is it uh, sensors at operations once the well is put into production or is it all of the above where where, where uh, like how how are you seeing this Sure. Yeah. You no. Know, there's there's several different dimensions to the challenge. So the first one that we worry about is literally distance. You know, you got a bunch of people out in the field that are working hard every day. Uh, they're drilling the actual rigs, and those rigs have a variety of different sensors, thousands of pieces of information that are being collected, uh, often in proprietary technologies. Yeah, frequently, so, uh, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. not, not often. I would I would argue this is a non-open, non-transparent industry, and and you know there, there's exactly value right. there, there's value actually to historically there's been value in, in uh, la- this lack of transparency. So I think you're quite right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You, you bet. So the first, first challenge is just making sure that you can actually ingest or digest all the variety of the formats of information that you have available from all the different sources. And so if you take that as the first point, then the next one is, you know, then how do I actually physically transport that data in a cost-effective manner uh, from the site where the operation is going on uh, to the places where the corporation normally has cloud-based or in-house storage archives or data lakes where they can then apply high-speed, high-scale computation analytics to it or reporting or visualization. And in some cases, the reverse has to occur. How do I push the calculations out to the edge so that I can do things automatically or semi-autonomously? So those are some of the challenges that that the industry is undergoing. And each oil company approaches the solution in a slightly different way based on their needs for security, based on their needs for propriety, uh, for, for data continuity or protection. Uh, but it's it's a really interesting challenge, and it all comes down to that real-time data infrastructure or that digital ecosystem that extends from the rig in a in a, a collaborative environment where the oil services companies are working together, uh, right through the office where the engineers that are in house in the oil company are working in isolation. That's very helpful, David. I wonder though if you might uh, help uh, because many of the members of the audience who listen to this podcast are not that familiar with uh, field operations in oil and gas, or may not be that familiar, I should say. Uh, could you walk through um, an example, uh, call it a day in the life of a piece of data, say a, a piece of data that's picked up by a sensor somewhere uh, on during a drilling operation, and how does that, how does it, how do you see that piece of data uh, being, uh, you know, processed, captured, recorded, secured, and then brought into, into, um, in, in, into a, a place where it can be used or interpreted by, by the uh, operators? Sure. Thanks, Jeffrey. Let's um, first of all focus not on – the oil and gas industry tends to be a fairly broad system as defined by the oil field life cycle. But let's zero in on just the drilling process for a moment to answer your question. Let's think about a problem that I would want to know as an operator. How quickly am I penetrating the drilling activity or the, the rate of penetration? Well, there isn't any magic sensor that actually tells me that. What I need is a couple of vital pieces of information. I need to know how quickly something is turning around, uh, namely the the RPM gauge on the drilling environment itself, on the drilling rig. So that, the, drill, the drill bit, the rotational activity of the bit itself. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then I need to know how quickly it is changing over time as it drills its way through the subsurface. So the the uh, the, the depth will change. Mm. So if we think about those two individual pieces of data as vital to the question that I'm originally trying to answer, I go back to the sensor. There will be a sensor on the rig itself that's usually installed by the rig manufacturer, might be maintained by them or by a subcontractor, and it will be detecting the rotations per minute uh, of the draw works or of the, the drill head that's holding that, uh, that drilling bit, of course, with, you know, with thousands of feet of drilling pipe in between. Mm. And so it's recording that. And that, that piece of information is being sent to usually some sort of process controller or some sensor in a language that that sensor understands. Similarly, there will be another sensor that's sitting on the draw works or the cable that actually unwinds and allows the block to change over time. And so it's recording the current location of the draw works. Now, if you think about those, those two pieces of information, they're being collected by different systems on the rig. They may be owned by the, the rig itself, but they may actually come from different sensors or different companies that created those sensors. They may fundamentally talk in different languages. Mm. So the way that the data has to flow, it's collected by those process control units. It's then converted into something that the subsystems that, that uh, the rig provided understands, uh, like a Profibus or a Modbus type language, which is a really, really low level signal oriented language. That data is then passed uh, to a control bus and um, sent on through the various pieces of technology that are made available. So, you know, it may come, be coming through uh, service provider company number one uh, for the hook load or sorry for the, the, the RPM, but service company number two might be sharing the information on the, uh, the actual depth of the bit and how that's changing over time. So those two pieces of information are now available in different systems. So how do I actually merge that together? Well, you've got to have some process that, that actually allows that data to be shared in a secured and authorized fashion. Then it needs to be translated into something that makes sense together because, you know, if you think about languages, let's assume that that um, RPM gauge is speaking in French but the uh, depth gauge is speaking in Italian. Well, in order for anyone who speaks English or something other than French and Italian, they have to translate that information into something that it actually makes sense for them. They also want to commingle or aggregate that information together so that they can see the two at the same time and perhaps feed them into the process mm -hmm. that's then going to calculate the rate of penetration. Mm -hmm. And so that requires a series of translations and data exchanges and hops through the system. And there's some open standards that are used in that process today that um, help. Uh, they're not used consistently across the industry or else you know, the world would be a much easier place to operate in. But there's some really, really good standards that have emerged over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, you know, things like the WITSML standard, which is designed to help share information in a commonly understood way so that it can be used by others in that process or other processes in that overall process as we try and uh, analyze uh, information. Yeah. Did that answer your question, Jeffrey? Yeah, yeah very much. It, it just uh, underscores uh, the 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 uh, what's hidden from from view until you get into the industry is the complexity uh, that exists because of the structure of the industry, the level of innovation that takes place, uh, the turnover of the technology, and and uh, the imperative to uh, make sense of it all. Uh, just creates opportunity. Uh, for um, uh, companies like Petrolink to, to to make a difference, what, what's what's been the industry's reaction when you walk in and and say, "Hey, I've got a I got a better way to do this." Uh, <laughs> I mean, they've been working, you know, for a long time in the absence of of um, this kind of sophistication. So, uh, what, what's what's the reaction typically? Well, that's that's a really fun question to think through. I've been working with data standards in my career um, for almost the entire time. Uh, that that WITSML, which is W I T S M L, for anybody that wants to actually go look it up. Um, that that industry standard started um, probably twenty years ago. And when it was first introduced, it was actually introduced by the oil companies because they had a problem. Mm. 
they needed to share information between their partners. And so they brought their service providers in and said, service providers, come on, you're using system A and your competitor is using system B. And so we're, we're always looking at apples versus oranges when yeah. we're trying to look at this. And yeah. it's just not going to work. And so they suggested the standard or finding a way to be able to share information in a non-competitive way that would allow innovation but would allow um, a partnership among um, competitors. Uh, and and at first that was met with not necessarily resistance because it was known, but as oil company services, uh, all of our companies that work in this industry, we of course want to, to, to be profitable for our parent companies. And that mm. means that we want more business. And so we want to compete. And so of course, the first reaction was looking at these standards as encroaching on our ability to solve the problem from the point of the sensor all the way through the analytics. Mm, yeah. It's, it looks like a you know, cramp on innovation, frankly. And yeah, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, why but, would you agree? But you bet. But what we found over, over the 20 years that this has been used is it actually has fostered innovation instead because it allows other people with other ideas to come into the room and kind of spur us all on uh, by not treating data as a, a precious, um, you know, an isolated commodity, but instead treating it as a corporate asset that fosters innovation has really changed things in the last 25 years. But to your point, when this started, it was met with a reasonable amount of skepticism and even in some cases, some hostility. Yeah, it's a bit like uh, how Apple invented the App Store and by uh, creating a layer within which uh, innovation could happen that uh, did not... Um, uh, or allowed the, allowed the uh, the creativity and the creative expression of of solution designs uh, to unfold uh, has uh, has unlocked untold amounts of of value for the, uh, b both for Apple as well as for all kinds of companies that are uh, in in that uh, ecosystem and and the oil and gas yeah I think this is a key key uh, key insight is that oil and gas by setting its data free, if you like. It wants to be free. <laughs> it's easily copied, so we know it wants to be free. Um, uh, by setting its data free, the, the industry is in a position to uh, unlock value that, that uh, presently is, it might struggle to find. Uh, exactly. In your, so do you see a further potential then in, in, in the industry? How, how far along is the industry in thinking differently about its data and its data assets and its utility over those assets? Sure. Yeah. No. There's there's always room for improvement. Um, if we start off with looking at the first step in the in the standardization process, and this this actually applies to all of the typical domains, whether it's the uh, uh, petrophysical domain, the interpretation process, the the design and planning, or the uh, the drilling, execution, and and production domains of the oil and gas industry, all of them have uh, you know a half a dozen standards that are used as the de facto foundation for sharing information. So for First and foremost, there's always room to improve the way that those standards are used and improve the take up or the adoption rate of them. But secondly, um, there is always room for introducing new concepts into those as they evolve. So I'm not talking about completely rewriting a standard, but adding a subtle points of clarity mm. or additional information that wasn't available 15 years ago when you first started the process of standardization and now making it available. Because the point in these standards is to produce a predictable stream of information that can be used by the digital ecosystem as we move into, uh, you know, semi-autonomous processes or machine learning or AI and start to leverage the power of technology and the innovations that have occurred in the last five or 10 years. Yeah, that's a really important point. Uh, the, the the standards are not static. And in fact, uh, there, there's a constant evolution of these standards and uh, even the, the launch of new standards bodies to tackle you know, particular challenging areas. I know uh, I've, I've read about a, a, a development uh, in Houston um, to create a standards for sharing the uh, subsurface information at a much level, uh, much deeper level of granularity and fidelity so that oil companies can do things like buy and sell assets much more easily, value those assets much more easily. So. Yes, yes, absolutely. This might be the group called the OSDU That's or it. the Open Platform <clears throat> for, for Data Exchange. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And 
And so th- this is a really interesting initiative because it's looking at not just how do I share information, but how do I manage that information so that I understand its history over time. Mm. You know, if, if you think about a subsurface sensor, I might be uh, sending some signals up from the ground, uh, from under the ground, uh, through mud pulse telemetry, which is a, a reasonable way to get a small amount of information very, very quickly and in, in, in near real time. So I'm kind of monitoring from 13,000 feet away what's going on through this media of sending signals through the mud, uh, the, the, the fluid the itself, column, yeah. the mud. Mm. Yeah. But then after I get the tool up out of the ground, of course, it has onboard memory. So I then can dump that data down. And I now have two versions of reality, one that was sent in real time that is somewhat coarse and one that is most likely very, very dense and very, very accurate. And so being able to put both of those two information pieces of information into my, my data lakes and being able to allow processes that need real-time information to look at the mud pulse version, but processes that need a more thoughtful or a more detailed analysis to be able to deal with the memory data and understand the difference is very, very vital. And so one of the things that the OSDU initiative is, is looking at is how do I actually manage that process and the fact that there's not one set of the truth. There is a proper digital ecosystem in many voices speaking to me. Yeah. So the OSDU is actually in such an important initiative. I had been contacted by a Canadian pension fund uh, who uh, invests principally in Canadian oil and gas companies, but were had heard about this and were curious about what it takes to get such an initiative moving so that uh, in their case, they could influence uh, the board's uh, companies on which they are a member of the board but through their investment profile uh, to and create a, a, an equivalent initiative in Canada or at a minimum get involved in the OSDU south of the border so that Canadian oil and gas companies could uh, be abreast of how these, these data standards are evolving specifically for this new, this new world of digital. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fast, fascinating. Now I've known you've been, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to point out that OSDU is actually a worldwide initiative. It's um, it's heavily used in Europe right now, and many of the partners that are involved in it are, are, are based in, Euro- in Europe. Right. So it's not just an American thing, but I am happy to say that all of the major service companies and many of the key software technology providers, even companies like Petrolink, are all involved in this initiative now. It's, it's uh, taken on a, a life of its own. It's a really fascinating uh, initiative that's going on, and it builds on the shoulders of other da- data standards like those from, from uh, you know, the, the POSC Caesar and the energistics communities quite, quite well, uh, specifically in the reservoir space for right now, but it will eventually look at how we actually deal with uh, drilling information and possibly even production. I don't want to speak for their, for their directors, but, but uh, we are involved in that as well here at Petrolink. Are there, are there any, um, as you've kind of gone through the journey of, of evolving your, um, your, your offerings uh, to, to deal with this, uh, the, the uh, uh, new digital world that we're in, uh, what, what lessons have you taken away? If you had to kind of highlight the one or two critical insights that you've gained, uh, what, what would those be? Sure. Well, a couple of them. You know, first of all, um, one of the things is to always be looking ahead. You know, there's there's some industry standards out there around how you look at changes and being um, nervous to adopt change. If we're going to innovate in the oil and gas industry, we can't be afraid of the technology that's changing or the industry that's changing around us. Uh, we have many, many different um, different things that are happening around us that are changing our world. But I do want to throw out an example. You know, if we rewind the industry a little bit, and I'm older than, than many of the podcast listeners might be, um, <laughs> I've been in this industry for a while, and I have a lot of gray hair to prove it. I, I can but, agree. You know, to, I can attest to that. <laughs> I have I've, I've shaved mine all off, so you, you, at least you've kept yours. <laughs> there you go. Well, if you think about your first cell phone, you know, I remember my first cell phone. It was the size of a shoebox. It was pretty big. Uh, fast forward to today, who thought that it was a good idea to put a camera in your phone? Mm. You, you know, but we use that every single day now. I don't take notes anymore. I write on a whiteboard in a meeting. I'll be talking to some of our engineers or some of our clients. We're spewing on the whiteboard, doing some collaborative, collaborative sessions. Mm. I just simply step back and take a photo with my with my phone. 
Mm-hmm. Who would have thought of that? So one of the lessons to think about as we as we look at this digital experience is don't be afraid to try something because it's creative thinking that will get us to the next level. Mm-hmm. If you look at the challenges we have in the oil and gas industry, they, you know we're feeling pressures, of course, on the economics. We always will. We have to make it more efficient. We have to be more effective. We have to be more um, more careful in how we actually spend our parent company's uh, money in this space. But at the same time, if we look at the opportunities of the changes in the technology that is around us in the world with the increases in, in machine learning and high-powered, high high-computational analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things that, that is becoming uh, the digital rig of the future, uh, the information that's available to us will literally be a change that is completely synonymous with how the Industrial Revolution started with the introduction of the steam engine. So the lesson learned for me is to look for those creative ways to take advantage of the opportunities or take advantage of the technologies and try something new that helps to uh, improve the efficiency and the operational capacity of our industry because that's where those innovation ideas come from. And, you know, that may come from uh, two guys in a garage that think up a better process and then we need to find ways to adapt that in the field of the future tomorrow. Mm. It reminds me too, though, that the uh, second second part of that story is uh, to have the courage to trial them and uh, put them into force and, and uh, be prepared to walk away if, if they're, you know, they're not, not uh, playing out. Um, but but equally importantly, be prepared to uh, run version two, version three, version four, and and uh, keep plugging away because uh, frequently that that's also what what's required for for success. Absolutely right. Don't be afraid to fail. Just <laughs> fail, fail gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> Quite right. All right, David, this has been a treasure to uh, speak with you. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time today. Um, if if anyone who's listening would like to learn more about uh, uh, Petrolink and what you're up to, your uh, insights, and to follow you on social media. How, how might they do that? Sure. I can be reached uh, you know, directly through email at um, david.johnson at petrolink.com. Uh, I also have LinkedIn profiles and uh, sometimes I'm available through uh, through my mobile phone if you can reach me there. <laughs> uh, but uh, but quite often I'm, I'm in meetings and, and end up not answering directly. So, you know, best way to get a hold of me is probably through an email or to send a note. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a fun time to be alive in our industry. I want to offer a word of encouragement to those that are thinking about joining the industry. You know, if you think about all the things that that are challenges in our industry and in particular, you know, that, that, that our company are, are focusing on security and securing that rig of the future and finding ways to creatively uh, use the information more effectively and, and make sure that it's available at the right time, the right place, in the right format, uh, right through the high-end analytics and, and the automation processes that are being introduced in, in limited cases. This is a really fun time to be in the oil and gas yeah, industry. Yeah, this is not. Not, this is not the time to leave. Actually, Tra- energy transitions are uh, are are few and far between in human um, existence, and we're right in the middle of one. So now's the time. What what's the website, uh, uh, David? How does someone if someone want to ping your site? What 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 should they look for? Sure. Um, yeah, the, the corporate uh, website is just www.petrolink.com, uh, and that that way you can uh, drop notes from there. We have a, a rotating amount of uh, of marketing material there that shows some of the insights into what we're doing as a company, mm. and even working with some of our partners and, and oil company clients as we innovate and try new things that uh, that are proving uh, proving to bring them value and reduce you know a significant amount of, of time and, and introduce efficiencies into their work. Flows. Thanks very much, David. Uh, this has been a uh, episode of Digital Oil and Gas. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you liked what you heard, press like or share this episode and uh, tell your friends about it so that they can find uh, Digital Oil and Gas on the platform of your choice. Uh, David, thanks again. And uh, we'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content.
You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter at Jeffrey Can or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book entitled Bits, Bites and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil and Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.